I was going to pray. Jesus, we worship you. This is all for your glory, God. I ask you to speak to our hearts. God, that whatever we have said in front of you, that we take it away right now and we put you in your right place. It's all about you, Jesus. There's no one like you. There's no one above you. There's no one beside you. You're incomparable. You're matchless in every way. You're beautiful. You're glorious. <laughs> There's no one like you. Thank you for loving us, God. Thank you for loving us in such a real and tangible way, Jesus. Thank you for your spirit. I thank you that you dwell inside of us, that we can never be separate from you. We just worship you, Jesus. We love you. <laughs> just going over and over again. I love you. I love you. I love you. You're so beautiful. You're so beautiful. You're so kind. You're altogether lovely. You're everything that is lovely. You are love. I could just stay in that all day. That's where I've been all week, too. Let me get into my notes. So I had an opportunity to, with my group of friends that we have, we go, is that better? Is that good? So we go We go on trips together. Uh, we'll go to Florida, and we've been to Ohio, and um, basically we go to conferences or, um, events and stuff like that. And, um, I guess you, I wouldn't call us conference hoppers per se. Like we don't, we don't go to conference to conference to conference just to get filled up by the Lord. Cause that's what some people do. You know, they just conference hop and conference hop and then they get touched publicly by God and then they don't sustain it when they get home. Like I say before that the public touch has to turn into a private kiss or else you've missed it. And it's seems like it's all for naught. Um, so when we go to these conferences, I'm I'm pretty like aware of the structure of them, and um, there's and it's just such really powerful, like really good speakers, really dynamite worship, like the stuff that you listen to on the screen is like these are the actual people that are doing it, and it's just like a whole different experience when you get together with like 600 people that are corporately saying I'm here just to worship you. And um, that would be cool if that was the agenda of everybody that went to the conference. And actually, that'd be cool if that was my agenda when I went to the conference, too. But I found out that when I went to this last conference, it was called Habitation. And it wasn't, it had like some of my favorite speakers in there. It was like Corey Russell, uh, Eric Gilmore, and a guy named William Henn. And I know all three of these guys. And I'm, as soon as my friends asked me if I wanted to go, I said, yes, please, sign me up. Especially if they're going too, because when we when we go to these things, we get a nice you know we work hard, we work together, we we do ministry, and this is like a really nice break for us to come and come and get refreshed. And um, even better than the conference is is the time that we get to set aside with our friends and our and our godly fellowship, where we get to we get to um, spur each other on and um, you know say hey, what about this? And when there's areas of your life like is this really sweet? The conversations that we have. Like I'm telling you, find some people like this in your life that you can call up on the phone and say, Hey man, how's your heart? How's what's the Lord been doing? How's he working in your life? And then there's like this accountability that takes place and this like just the, the knowing that I have people in this life that are going to hold me accountable to to what I say and what I do and um that really helps me in in my in my processing. Everybody here's my beautiful wife. Hi. <laughs> you <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know you don't like that. I just can't help myself. It's like when you see something beautiful, you just got to look at it. So I went to this conference, and it um, it became very apparent that when I walked through the door, that it uh, it wasn't a normal conference. And then um, we started worship, and um, the guy that got up there that was it was so weird because when he was speaking, he was doing this. And then he'd keep speaking to us, and he'd be facing this way, and it was, and then he'd he'd come this way, and then he'd still stand this way. Like, would that be weird if I preached the whole message like this? 
but it it made me think about something was he was he was looking directly at the throne like he wasn't he wasn't like he wasn't enamored with what was here and um i need to speak to you he was he was ministering straight to god's heart and it was like and his, i just realized his eyes were closed so he didn't even really know or care where he was at on the stage it was beautiful um back to the story um so we start worshiping and he's um, he's saying uh, exactly what Rod said when I just fell, fell down over here when you said the people, uh, he will inhabit the praise of his people. I'm like, that was like what this conference was. And um, we started worshiping, and they, um, it was like a beautiful Jesus song. And um, it started all nice and soft, and then it carried. And I wish I could sing, because some people who can preach can sing, and then it's just a lot better. But I'm not one of those, not yet anyways. <laughs> All things are possible through God, right? <laughs> For those who believe, I believe that I will be a good singer one day. My wife probably thinks I am, maybe. <laughs> um, so we started singing, and it was just like, it was just like, oh man, I was like, yes, I love this song. And I was like, okay, let me prepare my heart. Boom, Jesus, I worship you, I worship you, I love you. Okay, time to do it. And then it's just like beautiful, 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 beautiful Jesus. And um, as soon as that was done, it kind of carried on. You could hear some people singing, singing in tongues, and then all of a sudden, we didn't go to the next line. I was like, what's the next line? And it's just like, we went right back to beautiful, 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 for like 20. I was like, okay, I can get on board. I can do this. Yes, of course he's beautiful. Why can't? Why, why am I getting irritated about just keep singing beautiful, beautiful Jesus, even though there's more to that song? And then I was like encountering him, and I was crying, and he was moving on my heart. And then I started to think in my head, I was just like, I wonder who's preaching. I wonder if it'll... I wonder if it'll be William or maybe Corey. Yeah, I think Corey might be first. And I started thinking about that kind of stuff as everybody's singing about how beautiful Jesus is. And then, um, and that was 20 minutes into it. We sang beautiful Jesus for like close to 40 minutes. And um, at about minute 30, after I was done thinking about everything that I wanted to think about, um, I was like, why are we still stuck on the same same dang line boom boom over and over again over and over again I'm like yeah he's beautiful and I'm like why do I start to feel frustrated at why we're stuck here and then I like look over at my my friend and she's just like got that look on her face and she's she's kind of wobbling back and forth my other friend's on his knees and I kind of look out in the crowd and this person's laid out that person's laughing and there's like all these people are encountering Jesus and have been for 45 minutes on the simple phrase of oh beautiful Jesus I lost it because I wasn't I wasn't worshiping him I was thinking about what's next and what's to come and who's the next speaker and really I lost sight of what I was there to do and I was to worship Jesus and it was like he hit me so hard then he was like if you would just look at me you'll get it and I said but aren't I looking at you and it it really wasn't because I was looking to the next song and the next verse and the next the next and the next instead of just simply being in his presence which is enough which is actually all that you need because he is all that you need and that brings me to the title of this sermon which is first love (laughs) and in that moment I had a deep 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 revelation of how of how Jesus was not my first love even let me let me read revelations 2 4 and i'm going to read it in the amplified or the the passion it says but i have this charge against you that you have you have left your first love you have lost the depth. So what that means on, okay. But I have this charge against you that you have left your first love or you have lost the depth of love that you first had for me. <laughs> that was me, guys. Goodness. God just like, and when he, <laughs> so hard to explain because it's an experience that I had that when he, he said that you are, you are who I'm talking about in Revelations 2.4. It's like, how did I lose my first love? How did I, like, I don't view myself as higher or anything like that, so hear my heart when I'm speaking about it, but it's like, 
I can I can be in the youth group. I can pray for people. I can preach up on stage. I can do ministry and hold it. And I got I got all of these things that I think qualify me to be in love with Jesus. And I want to apologize, guys, because I've lost my I lost my first love for Jesus, and that was that love that I had for Him when I first said yes, when He became so real to me that I couldn't do anything but lay on my face and cry about how beautiful he is, how lovely he is, how passionate he is. And what was really cool is when God revealed this in my heart, in no way was I sad for a minute. So if if you guys are receiving sad coming out of me, it's not. I am overjoyed that the Lord can speak to me in such a way and say, hey, 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 look at me. And all this while I thought I was looking at him, but you can you can let these very things get in the way of your relationship with Jesus. I let, you know, you know, you guys hear what I say. It's you want to be a great man of God, pray every day, read your Bible every day. I definitely pray every day. I definitely read my Bible every day. But lately, I God has been really revealing to me that it's a lot like checking off the list. And I believe I, I preached that like one or two times ago that you can read your Bible every day and you can still become become complacent. And there's a different level of complacency that I didn't realize that people are, are capable of. I am capable of keeping myself busy, keeping myself, and like I would read the Bible for like 25 minutes, and then um, I'd find myself looking at my watch, and like God would like bring this up to me when he was ministering to me during that song about when I read my Bible and even when I glance at my watch because I still said something else in front of him. And I, I set my Bible reading time and my prayer time in front of him. And you can do that because I was doing it to check off a box. I was doing it because this is how you become a great man of God. <laughs> when I got this revelation, it's it's killing me. It's killing me in all the best ways because it's killing the part of me that doesn't need to be there. The part of me that says there's order in their structure to my quiet time with Jesus. There's order and structure to my secret place with Jesus, but really there's not. There's just sit there and listen. So my Bible time, it looks an awful lot like this. Okay. That's everything because I need to wait on him. I need to hear his voice. I need because if I if I just go into here and and try to try to go with it, it's 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 all work. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Like you can make this Bible work. It's alive and it's living and it's breathing, and we have to eat off, eat it. It's like it's served to you, and you have to eat it, not just look at it. Because when you just look at it just to fulfill some time, you're not getting fed. You're not getting filled up. You're getting revelations, yes, but. And the, let me see. The devil wants to blind. I wrote my notes. The devil wants to blind you from God's glory and distract you. I find far more God through the enjoyment of Him than anything else. So the the biggest thing on on reading your Bible and in praying, like the biggest the biggest steps and things that I've overcome in my life have come through enjoying God. And I wasn't necessarily enjoying him in my secret place. I was fulfilling an obligation and a time and a standard that that maybe I set instead of the standard that he set, which was just sit here and look at me, just sit here and be with me because nobody else matters. What do you want? What do you want to say? That doesn't matter either. Just be quiet and listen to me because I talk a lot, right? So he just wants me. The main thing he wants me to do is just be quiet and listen to him. And then when he starts to breathe, the revelation comes and the, the loving and the understanding and the, the direction that he wants to give you is unbelievable. And once we start seeing Jesus rightly, we can put him in the place that he belongs, which is first. And how do we do that? By keeping our eyes on Christ. And if we're supposed to set our eyes on him, then I was setting my Bible in front of him instead of me. I was setting my agenda in front of him instead of me. So in order to set something up there, Gilmore was saying it great. He had a water bottle up there, and he said, I set this water bottle there, and it will stay there because I've set it there. So the same as in when you set your eyes on Christ or eyes on Christ, what are you setting? 
before the Lord? What are you, what is getting into that into the way of you seeing him rightly? Beautiful, magical, like the relationship that you get to have with him versus the religion that that comes through. Like I was, <laughs> it's hard to suck to say, but I was like religiously reading my Bible, and it's not about religion. Like I said last time, it's about relationship. So I was even. You can. I just want. I just want you guys to see my heart here. That I'm like. I was in the trenches. I was doing it. And I was like. I was right there fighting the fight, and I was still doing it wrong. You know what I mean? And you know what God said? He didn't. He showed a beautiful picture, and it was a uh, like the candle. And you know when you blow it out, and then there's that smoke that rises up, and the wick's still just a little bit red. That was me. And God didn't see it and go stupid candle always going out like that can't you ever stay lit can't you ever sustain that fire how many times do I have to light you again God didn't speak to me that way he goes oh there's still something there and he blew on it (laughs) and boy he started that fire again and he he's not he's not mad at me He's not disappointed in me. God, he loves me so much. And he loves me even more that I realized who I am and where I'm at. I am absolute poverty. I'm absolutely broken. I am absolutely nothing unless you're here. Unless you come, none of this will work. And unless I'm looking at you, nothing will go the right way. And I'm going to go, uh, sorry if this is going all over the place. I'm trying to keep it straight. Uh, John 14, 23, Jesus answered, if, and I'm reading this one out of the Amplified as well. Jesus answered, if anyone really loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling place with him. He will inhabit the praise of his people. And those that keep my word, I will come down and I will make my dwelling place in him. We're we're making a, a habitation for Jesus. He can come down and he can dwell in his people. And it says those that keep his word. That's just like... Do you want Jesus to dwell inside of you? It tells you how to do it right here. So how do you make yourself into a habitation? And the best way that I can explain it is to have a love relationship with Jesus. You have to have a love relationship with Jesus. I can have a business relationship. I can have a friendship but it's that love relationship because he says, <laughs> he says, I love you. It's, it's loving the lover, the one who loved you first. It's the, I love you too. And there's no one like you. Whew, that's good. <laughs> the, I love you too. And there's no one like you. Eric Gilmore said, the beautiful thing about Jesus is when you see him, you realize he was the only thing you ever wanted. You just didn't know it because he gives you all the desires of your heart. And it's like, well, I want a car. And he was just like, no, you don't. He was like, you want me because he fulfills all of those things. And if your desire is truly and only to Jesus, you'll You'll lock gazes with him, you'll lock eyes with him, and you'll never want to look away because everything else is lesser. Because he's, <laughs> we're a bride, and he's coming back for that bride, and he's looking for somebody that hasn't been with the world. Now hear me out, feel this. Imagine Jesus comes to your door, and he knocks, and it's time, and he's coming, boom, 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 and you open that door. And you are with another lover. Like, how would you feel if you walked up and knocked on your house and your wife was with somebody else? (laughs) It's always that funny joke. Is this where you want to be when Jesus comes back? (laughs) Is that where you want to be? And um, if we're never separate from him, he's always knocking on that door and he's always saying, let me in. Hey, let me in. Like he couldn't just, and sometimes he does. Sometimes when we're stubborn, he does just kick in that door. 
Jesus, let me, and then it's so cool, let me never be found with another lover. Some people even listen to this might be like, man, that guy's weird, but he's just, he's just messed me up in such a way that there is a, a love relationship, an exchange of my heart for his, because that's all he wants is everything that I am. He wants... <laughs> He wants everything that I am, and that makes me so excited because I know that even if I do not view myself as highly, he views me as everything. He became a man, got put on the cross by men, was crucified by men for men so that he could be with man. And once you get a revelation of the gospel, that's the gospel he made. The the God of the universe made himself man to be with man. Man was not worthy, but he made us worthy. He got what we deserved, and we got what he deserved. To, to, to eat at the table with the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the lover of my soul, I worship you. And I'm going to go to Psalms 27, 4. One thing I ask the Lord, and that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, or in his presence, all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty, or the delightful loveliness and majestic grandeur of the Lord, and to meditate in his temple. Golly, one thing I ask. God, Lord, there's one thing that I ask, and there's one thing that I'll seek, that I may dwell in your house, that I may dwell in your presence all of the days of my life, that I may gaze upon the beauty, the delightful, the loveliness, the majestic grandeur of the Lord, and I will meditate in your temple. Golly, just just set your heart on saying that. Renew your mind. <laughs> Jesus, let me set my eyes on you. Let me set my eyes. And because that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. And he already said that he wants to make his house inside of us. So we don't have very far to go to dwell in the house of the Lord because he has already made his house in you. And that's where he wants it. That's where he wants his presence to be. He wants to be where you are and he wants you to feel his presence. And it's such a real and tangible way. And he chose us to dwell in, like, ugh. So at this conference, it was, you know, this was uh, the Psalms 27.4 was a, a really big staple in, in what they're trying to do. And I've I've learned so much from this conference that, when they say that it's no agenda, it's just Jesus, and um, we're we're only here to focus on you, Jesus. But this conference that is just so unexplainable. How we had, um, we heard one of my friends heard one of the uh, baristas talking at the conference, and they were like, "Don't they know this is only a three and a half hour session? Like, who in their right who in their right mind would worship for two and a half hours? They barely left any time for offering or the speaker." Yes, yes. If we could have worshipped for four hours, we would have. <laughs> but it was all about paying attention to the Spirit and where he was moving and how he was moving and what he wanted to do. It was just like God, there was like such a thing where it's like, God's like, no, not yet, not yet. This person needs it. Okay, they got it. And then we, and then we went into the next one, and it was like, it was just so humbling and so real this weekend that I had that I got to go back to the blessed of the poor in spirit because I got to realize my absolute po poverty other than looking at him, and I wasn't looking at him. I was pretending, it sucks to say, I was pretending to look at him. God, that sucks to say out loud. But it doesn't suck. That's what the world would say. Oh, that's embarrassing. I can't believe that. But God was just like, that's my boy. He's looking at me again. He's refocused his eyes. He's He's renewed his mind. He's... He's decided to sign up and say yes again and get back to his first love to when me and him first met and I got to <laughs> kiss him on the forehead and say, I love you and I will never quit. And the times when I was putting out my hands and saying, you're real, you're real. 
how do we lose that? You know, such a such a raw and real feeling, and such a a tender embrace. And then we go back into the world, and it's so easy to be replaced. Goodness. Don't replace the tender embrace. <laughs> That's a good one. So we're we're out in Dallas, and um, the Lyric House Church starts at 2 o'clock on Sunday. And um, something is crazy. Also... When I was in Dallas, I saw this lady, and she was just like, just ugh, hardcore limping, and then her husband was behind her, and Lord moved on my heart, and he was like, go pray for her. So I waited and waited and was polite until they were done uh, with their getting their coffee, and they're limping, they're limping, and I asked Tiffany, uh, my friend, to come with me, because it's kind of weird if you're, you walk approach a lady, and, and a lady and a man, and you know, you're like, hey, what's wrong with your wife? And then they're like, get lost, mind your own business, kid. So it's always better if you like approach them in two. It's just kind of a strategy. But um, I went up and I said, sir, sir, uh, what happened? And then he was like, well, what do you mean? I was like, your wife's limping, man. What, would she, she get hurt or something? Um, and he was like, yeah. And she's like, yeah, I'm in physical therapy. I got a, I got a bunch of, bunch of like stuff here that is just really messing me up. And I was like, cool. And then he was like, what's cool about that? And then I was like, uh, well, I'm a Christian, and um, we we have faith for these kind of things, that when we lay hands on the sick, that they're healed. And uh, we've seen many instances where where this happens. Oh, no, no, we're good. We're good. We're fine. Are you fine? Why? I mean, she's still limping. I don't know how fine you can be. And uh, he was like, hey, hey, we're Christians. I was like, Cool. So can I pray for you? <laughs> but it was just like you got to be ready for that kind of stuff, guys, because um, you guys are probably thinking it was going to be a really cool healing testimony. But nope, I got shut down. I didn't get shut down. That guy shut down Jesus. So immediately I started to feel regret and what well, maybe I didn't say something right or whatever. Nope, my eyes were on him and my eyes were on them. And first they were on him, so they could be on them. And it's up to them to soften their hearts and be, you know, she could be. She could be walking free, and she she pro- she might be walking free because just because I didn't hit her, maybe there's two other people that boom boom that third person. He goes, you know what? We've heard this three times this week. Just go ahead, you know. So I did not. I don't have failure in him denying me because I'm not a soul winner. I'm a seed planner. So as long as I can get in front of them and say, He loves you. Can I pray for you? I'm doing it right because my intention and in my heart was there. I wanted to minister to them. And then show them how to master to the Lord. It was beautiful. Even getting shut down can be beautiful because you're obedient. There's, ooh, there you go. There's beauty and obedience. Coming with all the one-liners today, folks. So we were on a, all right, we're doing good time-wise, I think. Yeah. All right, so we are coming back. We want to make it back for church um, and hold them because it starts at 2 o'clock. And so we have to leave Dallas at like four or five in the morning. I believe it's five in the morning. Um, cool thing about my friend Jason is he's one of those guys that doesn't let anybody drive. So I got to sleep. I felt really good about that. Every time we hit a rumble strip, though, I had to pop a wig just to make sure he was, because he's one of those guys that even if he's nodding off, he's, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And he is the finest person to drive out of all of us because he's just, he's the driver. I'm not a driver. I'm not one of those guys. I'll let my wife take the wheel anytime. So we're coming back um, from Dallas, and we're heading to Holden, and we're like, we're saying to each other, like, guys, we got to do church different. Like, look at what just happened here. Like, it's not just, you know, three songs, thirty minutes, make time, all that. And we we have to do we have to do something different. And and there, it's like it's small enough. And they got, like, live worship where you can, like, kind of prophetically, like, glide into it um, or even, like, expand it or whatever. So there was, like, lots of areas for opportunities where it could change, like, right now. Um, and they run the church, so it was really easy to, to change it. So we said, what we're going to do is we're just going to worship, and we're not going to plan a speaker. We're going to have three microphones, and whenever we feel the Lord move on my heart, we're going to go up and we're going to speak. 
it was absolute fire. We got back at like one o'clock, had an hour to set up for church because we have to set up all the chairs and move the tables and stuff like that. And all we did was was just worship, worship, and then you felt like there was this releasing that would happen, and you'd go up and you'd pick up the mic and you would just say exactly what the Lord was telling your heart, and it would be exactly for what was out there in the in the group. And um, my friend Jason said, um, "Okay," he gra- he got up and he grabbed the mic and he said, "It's time, let's go." And then I was in my head, I was kind of like, "Time for what?" Like I don't know where we're going. And he was like, it's time to get healed. And he was like, he was like, if you need prayer, he was like, don't hesitate. Come up here now. And um, there was a guy that was in the back. And he basically like pretty much like fast walked it, slow jogged it up. And Jason was sitting there. And then I was coming from behind. um, And I thought he would stop at Jason. You know, he kind of went up and he stopped at Jason. And I thought Jason would, you know, do the normal thing, lay some hands on him. Not Jason. He didn't do that. He grabbed this guy and he gave him like the biggest hug I've ever seen in my life. And he just held this guy. And this guy turned to putty because that is exactly what he needed. He needed the, the, the biggest hug you could ever get. The most loving hug you can ever get. And that's what I say about Jason. Like if you ever met him, just hug him. This guy has like a Jesus hug that when he hugs you, it's just, it's good. It's a, it's a wonderful hug. So he starts hugging this guy, and I come up behind him, and I'm praying in tongues, you know, and then I come up and I lay my hands on him, and it was like, it was so hard to explain. It's not like I got electrocuted, and it's not like I got, like, thrown back, but it was like, it was different. Like, nothing's changed about me, but everything was different because of where my heart was and where I've spent time being and that's in front of the king of king and the lord of lords and lover of my soul and when I placed my hands on this man I saw what Jesus sees and it was so cool because um like I flow in the prophetic and um you know I can lay my hands on somebody and I'll keep my eyes closed and I'll pray in tongues and then I'll start to get a picture and then I'll start to explain that picture but it wasn't that way this time it was an, an immediate infilling of everything this guy needed to hear. And as I'm praying for him and um, just releasing stuff and breaking stuff and he's crying and then he he falls out. We catch him and we put him down. And then normally I would like go to the next person that's waiting in line. But God said, tell him the fight is over. And then I look down at him. And he's wearing a shirt that says the good fight. (laughs) I was like, I see you, Jesus. So I just got down. I put my hands on him and I said, hey, God wants to tell you the fight is over. Take off the gloves. Get on your knees and worship him. You don't have to fight God any longer because you're tired of fighting and fighting and striving. It just doesn't work. He says that the fighting is done. And when I said that, he was like, when that happens, you're like, thank you, Jesus. And that was not me. It was all him because he said, and now he's wearing that shirt. And it's just like when you get to hear these things from Jesus, they're so beautiful. And it comes with some like great responsibility to to steward it too. And for it, like I said, like I always say that it doesn't point back at me and it never will. It never has and it never will because it's his glory. It's his honor. It's him we praise. I have nothing to do with it other than that he loves me and I'm obedient to him. And I said, yes, send me. So he's on the ground. He's crying. We're, we're going to go to the next one. And then he, he starts to wobble around and get up. And then he groans really loud again. And Jason says, what's wrong? And he says, I came up here to get my shoulder prayed for. <laughs> So we called for healing, and we got so caught up and uh, into like that ministry, and then I was just like, "Awesome, let's do it!" Boom, laid hands on him. Short, simple prayer doesn't have to be eloquent. Pain go now, shoulder be made right in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. He went like this, and his arms both shot straight up. And the people that he was with in the back, you could hear that gasp. Like he is healed, and he was. Get, it turns out he was getting shots in there. Yeah, he was giving. He was getting shots in his arms. 
in his shoulders and then it was, t- it was that wasn't working now it's time to get surgery and every time somebody would say that to me i would say it's time to get a new doctor <laughs> because because we don't want them speaking that kind of stuff over your life just like if you go to the doctor and my friend had a problem with his heart and they said said yeah i got svt and i'm like no you don't time to find a new doctor because we're not going to let somebody speak something like that over your life don't come into agreement with what they say you have because that's not who he says you are and that's what the devil wants you to do is to believe something like that and speak it into your life oh i have fibromyalgia just something i gotta live with no no you don't uh my dad had arthritis grandma had arthritis grandma's grandma before that arthritis so what we break that in jesus name yeah, I rebuke it. Break those word curses off your life because that's not who he made you to be. He made you to be perfect because that's how you are. Your body has to come in line with the word of the Lord. And that is that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Last time I checked, arthritis is not wonderful. <laughs> Cancer is not wonderful. A stiff back is not wonderful. Diabetes is not wonderful. The devil needs to know his place, and that's beneath us. Let's not get, I know Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, but when I say get behind me, Satan, I feel like we're on the same level, and we're not. That's why he got jealous. He is so far beneath me that he doesn't even, and I don't even want to talk about him anymore because he doesn't deserve to be talked about. He deserves to be talked about. We don't need to focus on the things that the devil is doing. We already know he steals, kills, and destroys. What else do we need to talk about? We know that Jesus comes to fulfill and give life. All of his promises are yes and amen. So after after his shoulder got healed, there was such a an expectancy that rose in the room of we're doing it right. <laughs> like cuz there's this like and I and I asked myself even if his shoulder didn't get healed would there be the same expectancy and I got to say yes. Because even if you prayed for 99 people and they didn't get healed, pray for that 100th person like all 99 got healed. Because that's where your faith needs to be. It needs to be attached on you said yes, I said amen, and I said we're, you said we're going for it, and we do. And like I said, don't ever get discouraged if something doesn't quote unquote go your way or go the way you think it's supposed to go. Because his ways are higher than our ways. We uh, we don't even you can't even wrap your head around his ways. So after that happened, um, Tiffany had a word, um, sh- and I I'm so glad the Lord doesn't work this way in me. But she was like, my toes numb and it hurts, and it goes all the way up to my knee and maybe into the back. They're like, is anybody struggling with that? You need to come up right now. And everybody was kind of quiet a little bit, and you know, old me would have been like, oh, getting nervous, but like, no, we know. It's a word from the Lord, and it happens. And her son comes up, and he says, well, it's not my toe, but my back does hurt. And she goes, okay, but we're calling out the toe, okay? But your back hurts? Let's pray for it. Boom, prayed for him. Not a single doubt in my mind this kid's not getting healed. Back healed. Perfect. And then after that happened, this lady came up, and she was like, I'm so sorry. Uh... The toe thing was me. And, it was, and she was like ashamed about it. And I'm just like, don't you feel ashamed, lady? Come on. You just needed to see another healing so that your faith got built up so that you could have a, enough faith to believe him for what you're asking for. So she comes up and I guess she had jammed her toe and it went numb, hurt all the way up to her knee. Um, and that was something that she's actually struggling with. And I remember when I uh, started doing things with God, um, sometimes a word of knowledge will come in the form of physicality. So like if, you're, if your back doesn't ever hurt and you're sitting there and you're like, oh, goodness, like what's going on? You better stand up right now and say, hey, who needs their back prayed for? Because this stuff ain't going to this ain't going to go on for much longer. And sometimes you'll do that. Like you'll get a headache or maybe your arm will start to hurt. Hey, I don't know what he did it to me a couple of times. And I asked him not to do it again because he can just speak to me. He doesn't need to doesn't need to give me the physicality part of it. I'm good. <laughs> like I, I'll, I'll listen. I don't you don't have to. And I guess in, in some people, maybe it helps them get to relate to where that pain is and how it feels and stuff. So I can't say the way God moves and. But I remember I asked God not to do that to me again, and he hasn't. Thank you, Jesus. So it was really cool because um, I got to get down on my knees. I don't like feet. I put my hands on her feet. 
because it's because those are beautiful feet if you ask jesus <laughs> right um and then i would ha i would get in the way if i was just like well maybe i'll touch your calf it's like no man your toe hurts get down there get on your knees and serve this lady so i got on my knees and i just said nice and simple pain go numbness go jesus name and then she was like boom healed just wonderful and at this point it's just like yep where's the next one like if, ooh, <laughs> if anybody would have had cancer in that room it would have been gone and um and we're feeling really pumped up but i know that that healing in her foot wasn't why she was up there it was just to bring her up there um so after that i said all right now i'm gonna pray for you and she's like oh praise god and then um she uh, i went to grab her hands and she had her eyes closed and she immediately put them up like this and she started blasting off in tongues and then i would um put my hand on her shoulder and i was going to start praying for her but i just i just felt like I said, I've I've spent so much time with him and so much tangible time with him that when I touched her, I saw what he sees and I hear what he's telling me. And he was like, and I told her, I said, hey, hey. And I stopped praying for her and I settled her down a little bit. And I said, hey, this is going to be really, really cool. I just need you to do something for me, okay? I want you to put your hands from here to here. Put them out and get ready to receive, okay? And then um, she put her hands out like this and I put my hands on top of them. And I said, I know this might be really hard, but I need you to quit praying in tongues, okay? Because you need to listen to what the Lord has to say. <laughs> and she was like kind of taken back a little bit, but I wasn't because I know what he was saying. And when I looked at her, I had like this different expression in my face that wasn't mine. And it was just like, I'm seeing rightly. I see you, Jesus, rightly. You can use me rightly. And um, normally my eyes have to be closed to like see these kind of things, but they it's just so cool. And what I saw was um, I saw, and it's it's so hard to step out on a ledge sometimes. And then even now I'm talking now, how could it seem like a ledge? Because you've spent so much time with him and you're hearing his voice and you're seeing what he sees. And I still second guess what I'm about to say to this lady. And it makes me feel so disappointed. And that's what the devil wanted to get me out of this moment. Um, but I know what I see and I say what I see. And if I missed it, then I missed it. Then so what? Just pray the love of God and everything's fine. So I said, I see and, uh, some land and some acreage, like a farm. Did you, did you just buy a farm? And then she just breaks down and the relief washes over me because I'm still in it. I'm still in that vein. I'm still saying what Jesus needs to say. So she had bought this farm. And the way I saw it, too, was so beautiful because it was um, it was in a box. And, you know, when you pull the bow and then all the all the four sides fall down at one time. That's what I saw. And I said, you know, that this house that you've bought, that you've been um, that you've been wanting it since you were a little kid, like you've been dreaming about it. You've been saying one day when I buy this, I'll have this. And I said, when the Lord gave this to you, it was in a gift. This is a gift that the Lord is giving to you because of who you are and how you how you minister to him and how you speak with him. And it's it's he gives you the desires of your heart. And that has been a desire of your heart since you were little. And it was just like it got to I got to and I don't want to go into everything that I told her because sometimes the stuff is personal. But I was like Jesus was calling out everything that needed to be called out. And I have no idea who this lady is. I've never met her. I don't know anything. Only thing I know that he is good. And he asked me to love him and love people. Love God, love people, make disciples. So that was two, three of them. We had another lady came up um, that said that her throat hurt and that she was just really going through some stuff. So I said, cool. And I wanted to like put my hands on her throat. It was just getting too like zealous. I was like, ah, I'll put it on the side or something like that. Or or you put your hands on your throat and then I'll put my hands on them. I felt like channeling the inner Benny Hen when he's like, receive. So we prayed for her and um, I started giving her some words that she she needed to hear. Throat got healed, obviously. Um, and then I was praying, praying, praying. Me and Tiffany, me and Tiffany flow really well together. It's just like we have like the same like thought patterns, or we're in that same place. Um, but when we're praying, I you know I'll pray, then Tiffany will pray, and then I'll come back in, and then Tiffany will go back in. And um, I thought that I was done. And um, God said, "What about her husband?" 
and I've seen her before in, in that church, and she has a couple kids, and I've never seen her husband. And even when God told me what about her husband, what did I do? I said, I don't even know if she's married. Wouldn't that be embarrassing? Like, I'm second-guessing again a word that God's giving me to say. Like, what is going on? And it makes me really frustrated that... um that I can be that way even after I've encountered the Lord and even after I, I know that I'm poor in spirit and that I need to come back to his first love, even that when I'm operating in these things and getting these revelations, I can still get in the way of what God wants to do. I need to stop and I need to say, yes, Lord. And all I need to do is say what he told me to say. I don't need to add to it. I don't need to take away from it. I need to say, what about your husband? <sighs> Washed over her, broken and I got a chance to speak words over her relationship with her husband. And what was really cool is um, God brings me people like that. And I get to tell them the direct testimony of who I am and, and what this lady did for me. I tricked her into thinking I was a really cool guy. And she prayed for me and prayed for me and prayed for me and prayed for me and loved me and loved me and loved me. Until that, that bowl of oil in heaven got so full that it tipped over and rained down on me and covered me in his glory. And I got to share with her with that and encourage her that even though you're trying and you're praying and you're, and you're doing, don't grow weary and doing good. Keep going. Keep praying because that bowl is getting full. And if you're worshiping him, he's not going to ignore you. Because what happens is when you're worshiping him, he send, sends down these angels and they, they swirl around and they grab the incense of your praises and they bring them back up to him and he looks at them and he, he smells them and he, he finds them acceptable and then he pours fire back down. So it's just like, how can, how can I get on fire for Jesus? Worship him. How can I pray for people and it be effective? Worship him. How can I be a good dad? Worship him. How can I be good at my job? Worship him. My friend Jason freaked out because after church I went up to him and I said, I'm handing in my resignation. <laughs> and he was like, what? What do you mean? I was just like, I can't do this anymore, man. I was just like, I have to be with just Jesus. Because I didn't, I'm not, in, like, I'm not quitting my job. That's, I just, I really wanted to. But it was just like, this is, this is all I want to do. This is all I ever want to do. I want to be in your house. I want to make a house for you. I want to praise you. I want to worship you. And I want to look at every single one of these people. And I want to say, I love you. I love you like he loves you. And I don't want to have to go back and do construction or go back and handle these board meetings. I don't want to have to go and do all these things. I just want to sit at your feet and worship you greatly because you're a great God. And Jason laughed because he knew I was kidding. And he, that's just like at that place where you're at where I've never felt this way before. Like when I when I preached about going to the school of evangelism, how I changed, how God radically changed me so much. It's like he's done it again on a newer and deeper level because there's there's his love and there's a container inside of us. And the more we love him, the more that container expands. And then the more we love him, the more it expands and the more it expands. And there's always more to it that can expand because his love is infinite and it goes on forever. Why do you think there's angels up in heaven circling God? Holy, holy, holy. And they have all these eyes around him and they'll be doing it for eternity because there's a deeper depth of his holiness, of his glory, of his splendor, his beauty. I imagine him going around saying, beautiful, beautiful. Because every time they look at him, they see a new way that he is beautiful. And that's the same with us. We can look at him and say, God, show me your beauty. You know, I was thinking the other day that, that Moses, this is kind of a weird revelation, but Moses was a real person. David was a real person. Flesh on earth living. And what did he do with Moses? He, he said, I want to see your glory. And he tucked him away in a rock. And he passed by him, just to his backside. Golly, show me your glory, Jesus. I want to be a man after God's own heart like David. God, help me be a man that's only after your heart. And then um, when they say that God doesn't give you anything that you can't handle, 
right? I automatically think about the bad things. Okay, well, God won't send a tornado to my house. Uh, God won't flood it. God won't um, get, you know, this person sick. He won't take away these finances because he knows I can't handle it. But then he got me thinking when I said, when I was saying in my prayer time, I was just like, Jesus, tuck me away like Moses and pass by me because I want to see your glory. It was so fun because he just chuckled and he says, I don't give you anything you can't handle. And in no way is that something to make you feel bad. It's actually super humbling because I know that there's more. I know that there's more. I want to see your glory. And he says, you can't handle it. That's why when the angels came down, people fell down to their face because they've been around that glory. So when I when I preach a message like this, I I sometimes get people that are that will ask me, you know, well, explain this. Well, can you explain this? Well, and then there's some people out there, and I'm not talking bad about anybody, okay? I just want want, I need you to realize where my heart's at in this situation. That when people, um, they read something like they're in their word, and um, they say, "God, I need this to make sense. I need somebody to explain this to me," because they're, you know, I have a friend like that that's always asked, "Why? Why? 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 You have to explain it to me. Why?" Um, but what's cool about the things that I'm talking about right now, and some people can't understand it because it has to be explained, um, you're missing it. Because you're on the road to explanation, and you need to be sitting at the table of his presence because his presence will explain all. Because if you're sitting at his table and you're, you're in his presence, you don't have time to say, why? Help me make this help, me make, help this make sense to me. No, because he gives you he gives you what you need, and he says, "I love you. You're glorious. You're wonderful." You know, and there's times where you sit down and there's like revelations, but we need to stop getting on that road to explanation. Make this make sense to me. No, make him make it sense to you. Because if you're sitting at the table of his presence, because yeah, because there's gonna be a wedding, and it's the reason I'm living is to marry the Lamb. There's the marriage supper, and we get to sit at that table, and we get to be with him. Broken record up here. (laughs) And then once you're sitting at the table of his presence, there's this love relationship. Because religion is kind of like an explanation. And sitting at at his presence is the, the intimacy. And if and if on if the insides of you don't burn like a fire for him, where if you don't, Eric Gomar says the word pine, like I've, I've, I'm I'm pining for you, I'm reaching for you, I'm longing for you. If I don't have you, this is not worth it. If you don't feel that fire inside of you, you're like the moon. You're all light and no heat. You need to be like the sun, life giving, burning on fire. And if that's not you. And you don't feel like you're, you're, uh, you know what I mean? You don't feel like you're burning on the inside. Like I couldn't stop sweating waiting to get up here. And that's not because I was nervous. It's because I was feeling the Holy Spirit. And it was just like, I just, I want to get up here and it's taking everything I have not to like run back and forth right here and only say the words, you're beautiful. And a lot of times when, um, you know, when we welcome the Holy Spirit, and I say it all the time too, we welcome you. I think we even said it today, we welcome you. It's not to say, hey, you can come in now. He's already here (laughs) because we've cultivated an atmosphere where he can just live and dwell. And really when we say we welcome you here, we're giving him permission. We're giving him acknowledgement because the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. And we say, I welcome you here. Your place is right. We, we, we give this for you to do what you want to do. Holy Spirit, come and speak to us. And what's funny is um, we, always, we always say stuff like, well, we've got to make room for God. You know, we've got we to make room for him, make sure that we give him enough room to move. And that's not God wants at all. He wants the whole dang room. 
we got to stop making room for him. We got to give him the whole entire room. We need to see the the house, the deed, the keys, the everything. I don't just give you a room, Jesus, because if I only give you a room, you will only dwell in that room. I give you everything that is me. Every single piece of my heart is yours because I don't want to give you only little bits. Because he can only he can only talk to you a little bit if you give him a little bit. He can only do as much as you give him and allow him to do unless it's that time to kick in the door and then you're oh, I surrender I give you everything it's all yours Jesus don't get to that point yet <laughs> get to the point where you will you willingly put it on the altar and you say is this an acceptable sacrifice Jesus and then he'll say do you love me and you'll say you know I do and then what does he say feed my sheep <laughs> Does that mean get up on a on a on a pulpit and preach when he says that? What does it look like to feed a sheep? Do you love me? Oh, he says that to me daily. I wake up in the morning and he says, Jesse, do you still love me? When somebody yelled at me, I had a horrible time with a customer and I was really mad and I got in and I just wanted to I just wanted to start talking crap. And then I hear that still small voice that says, Do you still love me? You know I do. Goodness. I could say that all day. Do you love me? You know I do. That's what he keeps saying every time he reminds me that when I take my face off of his, he still says, hey, do you still love me? You know I do. And he says, good. I love you too. You know, and a lot of time when I preach, it sounds like sunshine and rainbows and butterflies and it's just this love relationship with Jesus. There is more to it. Hell is a real place. And sin sometimes seems like a real issue. But what are we focused on? Him. Because if you love God, you'll love people. And like I said before, you don't, you don't, like, I don't cheat on my wife because it's the wrong thing to do. I don't cheat on my wife because I love her. I don't go actively talking crap about somebody because it's the wrong thing to do. I don't do it because I love him. I don't steal something, not because it's the wrong thing to do, but I don't steal because I love them. I have integrity, not because it's cool to have, or not because it's the right thing to have, but I have integrity because I love them. And he said, I'm full of integrity. I'm full of purpose. I'm full of power. I'm beautifully, fearfully, and wonderfully made in his image. And once we get to see Jesus rightly, Everything else can change. So I'm going to want you guys to close your eyes and uh, put your hand on your heart. Just close your eyes and don't think of the world. Don't think of everything I just said right now. I want you to really close your eyes. I want you to picture Jesus' face. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We just give you permission to have your way. God, I ask you to excite first love in our hearts. Jesus, I ask you to give us a I ask you to give us a burning passion, a fire and a desire that is only for you and nothing else will do. Because you're coming back for a bride. Help us be spotless. Jesus, I just declare that we are lovers of your presence. God, I ask you to take us off of the road to explanation and to sit at the table of your presence, that there is a seat with you. And only you. Holy Spirit, I ask you to speak to our hearts. God, I ask you to identify areas in our life that you feel we have set in front of Jesus, that we have set our eyes on other than you. Jesus, we just worship you. I ask you to help us see you rightly. I ask you, God, to help us see you rightly. Jesus, you're beautiful. You're wonderful. You're all things glorious. You're altogether lovely. 
You're the king of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You're the alpha. You're the omega. You're the beginning. You're the end. We worship you. There is no one like you. There will never be anybody like you, none above you, not beside you. You're matchless in every way. Jesus, I ask you to make this real to us. God, that may we never forget our first love, that first time when we said, yes, it's you. Yes, you excite me. God, give us a longing and a burning desire to see your face. I just want to see your face. And when I lock eyes with you, I want to do whatever you want me to do, Jesus. Help me be obedient. Help me not second guess when you speak to me, God. Help me set apart real and tangible time for you, God. Let me not just be going through the motions, God, because you do not like lukewarm. You spit it out of your mouth, God. Help me to never, ever be lukewarm in my life. God, we're just, we're just declaring right now that, that what we're living right now isn't enough. You give us your fullness, God, and we ask you to help us sustain that and use it appropriately, Jesus. I thank you that you give us the fullness. I thank you that you breathe into our life. I thank you that you love us more than we could ever be loved, God. I thank you that you are more than our mother and our fathers were ever could be. I thank you that you are a matchless father, a father who gives good gifts abundantly. I thank you, God, that when you give us gifts, we are good stewards of them to give them back out, God. So freely as we received, we give, Jesus. And whatever that looks like in our life, help us do it. Help us step off that ledge and say, yes, I'm all in, and it's only you, and it's only me, and I don't want to see anything other than what you want for me. So Holy Spirit, I just ask you to have your way. And when God touches you, it needs to come back to the secret place. It needs to come back to his feet because he's a refine. He will refine it. He will burn up everything that doesn't need to be there. God, we just ask you to speak with us. Speak with us. Speak with us. We need you. We need you. We need you. Without you, we are nothing. Without your words, we are nothing. Without your presence, you are nothing. Jesus, I ask you to come down and hug us. Give us a fresh touch from you, Jesus. That's all we're desiring. It's just a touch from you. One touch is enough. If you need prayer for healing for anything, come up to the front and we'll pray and watch God move. If you need a fresh touch from Jesus, just a re-signing up. And this, this is kind of like a pride thing where it's like, oh, what if somebody sees me, thinks I need a fresh touch? And if you've grown stale, you need to come up and you don't even necessarily need somebody to pray for you. Come out here and put your hands up like this and receive from the Lord because there's nothing that I could do or say that would, that would get you any closer to him. We need to see you rightly, Jesus. We need to see you rightly. Come and speak to us. Come and move on our hearts. Jesus, only you can move on our hearts. Only you can move on our hearts like you do.